right, so welcome everybody. Today we are gonna be doing uh, the Open for Neuroscience Tutorials is a tutorial series that we're running, helping people learn about what resources we have available from the Allen Brain Map the open data portal of the Allen Institute for Brain Science and how to use them. And today we are doing a broad introduction to the resources on the Allen Brain Map and how to use them and why to use them. So our agenda for the day, um, I'm gonna give you a brief introduction to the Allen Institute and then go through an overview of uh, selected resources in depth, but I am actually going to touch on almost all of the resources that we have available from the Allen Brain Map and some sample use cases. And then I will have plenty of time to go through Q&A and your use cases. So at any point, you can put questions in the Q&A in Zoom. Use that Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. And unless you need immediate clarification on something, we're gonna hold those to the end. We'll have lots of time to go through those. So if you have a sample use case, what are you doing with your research that you want to know uh, what resources from the Allen Brain Map are going to be useful. Uh, go ahead and post a, about three sentence description of your research in the Q&A box. And I'll take a few minutes to help match you to resources that I think will help. And we'll post all of the Q&A afterwards in our community forum. My name is Caitlin. I'm gonna be your guide through the Allen Brain Map today. I'm the training and outreach specialist at the Allen Institute. I work on training programs for scientists and programs and resources for teachers to learn about how to use our open data for research and for teaching. Please place all questions and research profiles in the Q&A panel on Zoom or ask them in the YouTube chat. Please use the chat to talk to each other about your research interests, share observations and other comments, and make sure that you're sending chat messages to all panelists and attendees so others can see your message. And we should have closed captions available on YouTube. The Allen Institute is a biological sciences nonprofit located in Seattle, Washington, with focused research areas in neuroscience, cell biology, and immunology. We also support cutting edge research across the world through the Paul G. Allen Frontiers Group. And across our institutes, our scientific process is focused on tackling complex, broad, and hard problems in the fundamental sciences. Our approach is guided by three principles, which I'll return to in a moment, big team and open science. Our work generates data, knowledge, and analysis tools, all of which we share publicly. And to date, we've collected about 14 petabytes of data in brain science. That's 2.9 million DVDs worth. The most relevant of these core, three core principles today is open science, which is to say we share all of our data, all of our analysis tools, and everything that we discover using this data and analysis tools publicly for you to use in your work. We have other webinars in this series to learn about others of our open resources, and we'll have the Open for Neuroscience Symposium and more tutorials on March 8th through 10th, 2021, to hear some talks about how these resources are being used in research and attend more tutorials. The Allen Institute for Brain Science has been around since 2003, and we've been generating open resources for the neuroscience community since day one. I'm going to cover basically all of these resources at least a little bit today, and some of them in more depth. So I mentioned that we have this series of tutorials that's going to be culminating in a uh, symposium with more tutorials in March to help new users learn how and why to apply our open resources to their research. After today's demo, you'll know more about which resources are going to be a good fit for your needs and where to find them. So I hope we'll see you at some more of these tutorials to learn about some of, some of the featured resources in more depth. So we have, again, the Q&A and chat here in Zoom. Um, so please use the chat and send messages to all panelists and attendees to chat with each other. Um, and use the Q&A box to ask questions and tell me a little bit about your research for a demo. So we are now going to head over to uh, brainmap.org. So if you want to follow along with me while I am presenting, uh, go to brain-map.org. So here we are, brain dash map. All right, I'm gonna arrange my windows here real quick. So we have three main websites from the Allen Institute. Brain dash map.org is where we are right now. This has our data, help, documentation, links to code, lab resources like mouse lines for our neuroscience work. Those can all be found or linked from here. At allininstitute.org, which is where you went to register for or find today's webinar, we have information on events, including virtual events, 
news, papers, careers, and more. And you might also be interested in checking out allencell.org, which is our resources for cell biology by the Allen Institute for Cell Science, one of the other research divisions under the umbrella of the Allen Institute, including how to order our fluorescent human-induced pluripotent stem cell lines, which can be differentiated into neural cells or glial cells and may be useful for your research, depending what you're up to. So how is this presentation gonna work? I'm gonna show you some of the selected resources here on brainmap.org. Um, I'll show you where to find them, how to use them a little bit, and some sample use cases to help you get oriented to what they're useful for, and how to interact with the data online and where to download it for further analysis. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time today on detailed methods of how the, the resources were generated. The goal here is to show you what we have available how to interact with it and download it, and some examples of how it can be useful. But if you want details, click the documentation link on the top of any page to be taken to white papers that detail the data collection. We share all of our data, knowledge, and tools publicly, both in the interest of transparency and to accelerate the field of neuroscience as a whole. Our data and tools can be applied in combination with your own to enable powerful analyses. So I'm gonna give some examples of how that, how, uh, that can be done. Um, and some examples of analyses that focus primarily on our uh, data as the main uh, object of analysis. We release all of our data as soon as it's quality controlled, well before we're done publishing on it. Um, we will never generate all of the findings that could be had from the data ourselves anyway. And we want it to accelerate the field of neuroscience. We want you to use this. Our data sets are also massive. 14 petabytes of data collected, two petabytes of which lives here on brainmap.org and some on some of our other websites. And in many cases, they aim to be comprehensive. And we also, I'll show you where to find our public data analysis tools and lab resources. Again, please ask questions um, as I go through these sample use cases, but there's uncountable ways of uh, how our data can combine with yours um, as, in order to be a, a control or a baseline for your data access to atlases and other types of data that you might not be able to collect yourself using our analysis tools and more. And I'm gonna cover with uh, where to go with questions after today. I want you to walk away feeling confident that you know which resource or resources are a good fit for your work, how to find them, basics of how to navigate and interpret them, and how to get more information later. So if there's any resource along the way here that I don't make that clear for, please speak up. All right. So we're here on our homepage, brain-map.org. Almost all of our neuroscience data lives here. You can find all of the databases by using this drop-down menu at the top of the page or by scrolling down and using these circular icons. You can come back here by clicking anywhere that you see an Allen Brain Map or an Allen Brain Atlas icon. So I'm gonna concentrate on some of the uh, especially popular, useful, and a few overlooked resources, but please take the time to explore all of these pages here. We're also about to have a new feature appearing on the homepage that will centralize all of our search and metadata. So please keep an eye out for that. It should be arriving soon. So I'm gonna start with our brain atlases. We have several brain atlases. That's this whole row and these uh, here that uh, show gene expression across genes and brain structures. And most of these are whole brain, whole genome. So what they show is how much of any given gene across the whole genome is uh, transcribed and present in RNA in any given brain region. We have different species, stages of development, a couple of different methods used, and some other variations on that theme, but they're all getting at that core idea of gene expression levels across regions of the brain. We also have anatomical reference atlases that you can find here for those gene expression atlases to help you map that to anatomy. We're not currently adding to any of these, uh, these gene expression atlases, but they will always be available. I'm going to start with the mouse brain atlas. All right, so this is a comprehensive high resolution atlas of gene expression in the adult mouse brain. Why mouse? Because it's one of the most common species used in neuroscience research. This was our very first project as an organization. And the idea is to help the research community by make it so people can look up gene expression instead of having to run it themselves over and over. You can look up gene expression again for the whole mouse genome and the whole brain. And this uses in situ hybridization, ISH, across mostly sagittal slices of the brain, showing the location and the relative amount of gene expression for all genes one at a time, individually. For the details on how we uh, developed and, uh, those ISH methods and collected the data, go ahead and check out this documentation link 
And there's a detailed papers that explain that in depth um, so that you could replicate it yourself if you wanted to. There's a few ways to search here. I'm going to concentrate on two of them. Uh, for differential expression, what genes are more expressed in one region than others, um, and for the uh, brain-wide expression of a gene of your choice. So first, I'm going to do differential expression. If you click on any of these selected regions, I'm going to do hippocampus, it's going to show a list of genes that are enriched in your area of interest compared to, by default, the whole brain. That's what gray he means here. You can also switch this contrast structure to have any brain structure uh, be the contrast. So let's do um, hippocampus versus um, cerebral cortex. So what we're looking at here is genes that are more expressed in the hippocampus than in cerebral cortex as a whole, um, and the relative difference in that gene expression level. So uh, Prosper homo homeobox 1, prox 1, is the gene that has the greatest differential expression in hippocampus relative to cortex. Uh, you can click on the experiment number here to see more detail about the expression pattern of each gene. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Um, so you can go back to the homepage here to do a new search by clicking on ISH. Uh, and alternatively, you can search by a single gene. So I'm going to pick a random gene. Um, and then you can pull up these experiments that show that gene's expression. We have a few different parameters here. So you'll notice some of these, uh, we have three sagittal experiments that, uh, and one coronal. And we have different orientations of the ISH probe, sense versus antisense. I'm just gonna pick one of the sagittal experiments to show you that uh, expression in more detail. So what you're looking at here is slices of ISH data. So we have brain slices that have been, uh, that have, are showing the expression level of, in this case, DRD1. And this is sagittal. So these slices are being arranged from the lateral edge of the brain towards the medial. And you can use these arrows to navigate through these slices. For a coronal experiment, this would be moving from the anterior to the posterior of the brain. For each gene on each slice, we have the ISH that shows the relative location and the intensity of the gene expression. And if you use this drop down menu here up in the upper right, you can switch over to a Nissl stain that just shows you where the cell bodies are to, um, to give you uh, a sense of the relative location of the cell bodies that you need for the ISH. We also have down at the bottom these summary bar graphs show the relative fluorescence. And DRD1 is highly expressed in the striatum, as expected. This gives a very coarse high level summary at a glance of the gene expression patterns. Um, note that the, the ISH data is semi-quantitative due to the signal amplification process. And the intensity of the signal is not linearly correlated with the amount of transcript present. The gene expression should always be interpreted in relative terms and compare with caution across genes because they go through this, the signal amplification process separately. You can download these ISH images from this page, or if you want to download more than a couple of genes worth, if you go up to tools, it will take you to the API, and, and that will give you instructions on how to download these images in bulk using an API search. There's another main way to explore the uh, mouse brain atlas data, and that is the Allen Gene Expression Explorer. So if you look in the header here, we see AGEA. So this lets you search with crosshairs to select a seed region. So I'm going to pick a random seed region. Um, so I've got the ventral posterior medial nucleus of the thalamus. And what you're looking at down here is a heat map that shows you what other regions of the brain have uh, gene expression patterns that are highly correlated with the region that you set that seed for. So I'm going to pick a, another random region. You can see that uh, for the amygdala, that these are the brain regions that are highly correlated with uh, the amygdala as far as the, uh, the gene expression patterns. And then down at the bottom here, we have this find genes button. And that is going to pull up a list of those genes 
that are highly expressed in your seed region that you selected on that heat map. We also have similar ISH, it's the same data that we've already seen, I should clarify that. It just is a visual search tool uh, that is searching the same ISH data that the other two views were also searching. We also have similar ISH data from multiple points in development in the Allen developing mouse brain atlas, and we have a spinal cord atlas for both adult and juvenile spinal cords in the mouse. So for more atlas uh, information on the developmental atlas, we did recently have a tutorial on that, so please check out the video of that tutorial which goes into much more detail on how to navigate and use that atlas. It has some, uh, some differences in how the data was collected and also some differences in uh, the online views of the data. So that is what I'm going to say about the mouse data. Now I'm going to go over to the Allen Human Brain Atlas. So again, to get back to the homepage, Allen Brain Atlas, and then Allen Human Brain Atlas. Like the mouse, this also covers the whole brain and the whole genome, but it uses a different method. Here we've got whole brain RNA microarray from six healthy adult brains. The teams dissected out each area of interest from each brain, isolated the RNA from that region, and applied the RNA to the microarray, where we read out the amount of transcript as fluorescence. Again, I'm not going to get into the detailed methods, but you can check out the documentation here for more detail. So like the ISH, this method also gives relative expression level, not absolute read counts of RNA. We are primarily going to be reporting the relative expression level as a z-score. And this z-score was calculated across the six donor brains, but only within one gene at a time, not across genes. So the genes are always treated independently. There's a couple of ways of searching this data as well. I'm going to focus on searching for a single gene. You can also search in bulk for these gene categories that are pre-selected with genes um, that are based on these different categories. And you can also search uh, in contrast to the mouse brain. So I'm gonna search for one gene here. Um, so we, uh, when I search here, it pulls up this heat map. So the heat map is showing the Z score of the relative amount of gene uh, for this list of genes that I've pulled up. So I searched for DRD and it's actually pulling up uh, DRD1, DRD2, and if I scroll down, there'll be more, um, a little more DRD2. Um, so note that we have multiple probes for each gene. Um, these each target a different sequence of that gene. So each gene is going to appear more than once in the results. We have multiple probes for uh, about 95% of all of the genes. What you're looking at in this heat map is this top row is our six donors. So each of these uh, colored bars designates the data from one donor. The second row, each of these colored regions on this uh, bar color codes for the structure of the brain. And then um, I have this set to blue versus red. The default is red versus green, but we do have this alternate view that's colorblind friendly. Um, shows you the relative amount of the gene in that region. So uh, red is more, green is uh, less, or uh, red is more, blue is less in this view. So if I click on it, you can see that it tells me what brain structure have I just selected and then a little bit about this gene, including the z-score of the expression level in that area. There's a couple of ways to interact with this data to get it into an anatomical context. Because this heat map is great, it gives a ton of information, but it doesn't really put it into any kind of anatomical context. Um, you can select multiple genes or probes using these uh, check boxes here. So I'm going to just choose DRD1 and DRD2. You can view the uh, heat map of just those that you've selected and I had some selected from a previous search. And then you can also view those on thumbnails. So again, red is higher expression, blue is lower expression. Um, and this gives you each individual subjects overall view of the expression patterns of that gene. Or you can just view one gene at a time. So I've just gone back to the home, the uh, heat map here. You can also select in this gene info area, select gene symbol, and it's going to take you to a more detailed heat map 
um, that places, again, it's the same data that you're seeing on that, uh, that big heat map, just into an anatomical context. We also have the MRIs for each of these individuals. So if you want to pull this data and map it to your own, that we have the ability to do that. We also, and that's that MRI data is here. We also have a limited amount of ISH data for the human brain for some neurotypical individuals and some individuals with selected neuropsychological conditions. Unlike for the mouse brain, the human ISH data only covers selected brain regions and selected genes. Um, the ISH methods are otherwise similar to the mouse brain and the data is interpreted in the same way. We also have data available on the developing human brain and the brain span atlas of the developing human brain. So that was also covered in that recent tutorial. So please check out that video. Uh, it's the same session for more information on how to access and analyze the data in that atlas. So for these humans and mouse atlases, there's uh, uncountable potential research applications. These are not comprehensive examples. They're just meant to get you started thinking uh, about uses of the atlases that are, uh, besides the most obvious use, which is just looking up what regions of the brain a gene of interest is highly expressed in. You can also do the inverse, uh, find what genes are highly expressed in an ROI, um, identify genes with expression co-localized with your gene of interest. That's especially easy using that AGEA uh, Explorer, um, but you can also download the data and do uh, your own analyses to find that. You can look at the typical expression patterns for a gene that's been associated with a genetic disorder. In the microarray data of the whole human brain gene expression, um, these were all healthy individuals, uh, so you can look up the typical gene expression patterns. You can find regions and networks where a gene is more highly expressed compared to other regions or networks. Um, look at expression patterns of gene, that it's homologs of interest from work in another species. And then including the developmental assays, you can look at uh, co-localizing genes in both space and developmental time and comparisons across species. I'm gonna go back to the homepage here using this uh, icon at the top. In addition to the human and mouse adult brain atlases and the developing brain atlases, uh, we also have uh, atlases on the mouse spinal cord and adult and developing non-human primate. These all use either microarray, ISH, or both to capture gene expression patterns across the brain and spinal cord. We also have a limited amount of pathology data in the aging dementia and TBI and IV glioblastoma atlases, which also capture some additional markers like proteins and the neuropsych neuropsychological evaluations. We don't have a rat brain atlas and we don't have any plans at this time to add one. So as I mentioned, the atlases will always remain available, but we're no longer adding to them. So now I'm gonna switch over to showing you some of our current work. So these databases are still being expanded. If you're watching this after December, 2020, if you're watching the recording or you return to the site later, know that more data and tools may have come available. So I'm gonna start with the Allen cell types database. That's here. So the ultimate goal of the Allen cell types database project is to categorize and organize all cell types and subtypes in the human and the mouse brain, develop complete descriptions and characterizations for every type, and be able to compare across humans and mice. So these cell types are based on what data? The most important to our cell typing is transcriptomics data. That's RNA sequencing right here. I'll come back to that in a moment. We have a couple of different variants on that technique. We also collect electrophysiology. Uh, we run the cells through a standardized set of stimuli and record their responses. And we get morphological reconstructions of some cells in three dimensions, so we get their shape. Most of our data to date has been divided into two streams. The EFIS and morphology go one way and the transcriptomics go the other way. So I'm gonna start with the transcriptomics. This is the bulk of our focus and also the larger fraction of our data. We have tens of thousands of individual cells here. So we have multiple data sets um, from mouse whole brain, whole cortex, um, and from human from selected brain regions, mostly from post-mortem donations. We have single cell RNA sequencing for mouse and single nucleus RNA sequencing for the human of the whole genome for both species. Um, and using our transcriptomic browsers online, I'll give this a second to load, we have pre-sorted these cells as defined by a handful of marker genes whose expression is by default loaded here um, that we have found through our research contribute to differentiating cell types from each other. But you can use this add genes button up at the top here 
to add any additional genes to this view. We've just preloaded it with this 15 or so genes that are most important to being able to differentiate these 150 or so cell types. So how do you read this graph? So the top here is this dendrogram that shows all of the cell types and their relation to each other. So the first branching point is uh, non-neuronal cells versus neuronal cells. So we have glia uh, characterized over here, and then the bulk of the cell types are neurons. And then the first break point within the neuron category is GABAergic versus glutamatergic cells. And then within that, we have all of these types and subtypes within those main categories. Um, so each of these columns represents one cell type, and then each row here represents one gene, and the color is telling you the average uh, expression level of that gene across all of the cells that fall into that cell type. Um, and you can get the sample sizes here by looking at the sampling strategy box. Um, so again, we have, we have de determined through our research that these are the genes that most contribute to distinguishing cell types from each other. You can see how that was done uh, in part using this scatter plot, uh, where each color represents one uh, cell type. And you can see that, they, that we have been able to cluster them so that cells that are more like each other are falling similar to each other on this plot. So this plot represents tens of thousands of cells. Um, and our online viewer helps you explore them and get oriented, but you can download all of the data from here, download data down in the lower corner. Or if you go back to this homepage here, we have information on how to download. It goes uh, to each of these different uh, data sets. Um, you can go in and you can download all of this information about the cell types, the gene expression, the metadata, um, and it's also all accessible via our API. Um, and you can interact with it using our SDK for analysis beyond what you can do in this online viewer. Um, and the transcriptomics data is going to be the subject of a more in-depth tutorial in March. Um, Christina is going to drop the link in the chat so you can see uh, more about how this data was collected and how and why it's useful. So that is what I'm going to cover on the transcriptomics data. So I'm going back to our cell types homepage. This is where I got to by clicking that circle on the uh, landing page back home. And I'm going to show you our electrophysiology and morphology data. That's on our cell feature search is where most of that data lives. Um, so this is for a smaller number of cells than the transcriptomics data, where we again have tens of thousands of individual cells. Um, for this smaller number of cells, we are uh, measuring their electrophysiological responses to some standard stimuli. That's uh, patch clamp. And we create 3D reconstructions of some of those cells as well. So I'm just going to pick a random cell here. We've historically done this for a smaller separate set of cells from the transcriptomics. And these cells come from living tissue that is donated by local neurosurgeons and their patients. So the regions that we get are dependent on surgical need. Um, so this represents a smaller subregion of especially the human tissue that we have this living, um, living human tissue that we get. Um, this was not uh, wrote in the lab. So in the realm, oh, uh, sorry, I wanted to show you this first before I move on. Um, so in our electrophysiology data, uh, what we have is the stimulus that was put into the cell, and then we have the cell response. Each uh, color represents one sweep in the stimulus and the cell's response. We've pre-calculated some, uh, some basic uh, characteristics of this cell that would be useful for a lot of uses. And you can also view this cell, um, both what it looked like and its reconstruction. Again, this is available for a smaller number of cells than the transcriptomic data. Um, and, uh, but we're still using it to develop cell types. So in the realms of all three of these, we use the open data to define the cell types that were the, the, like the ones that you see at the top of that RNA-seq dendrogram. Um, and we also publish all of our analysis tools on GitHub. So you can see how we've clustered our cells into types and compare our types to your own and use our clustering on your own data. All right, so as I said, we have mostly had the, um, the electrophysiology and the RNA sequencing data separately, but we have a new data set called PatchSeq. And this is in our featured new data and tools section right now. 
Um, and this uses our patching protocol, electrophysiology and morphology, plus RNA sequencing all in the same cells instead of having those in two stuffage strains. These also come from our living donors, so that controls the amount of tissue in the, the uh, regions represented for the human brains. And this is facilitating and reconciling the cell types between the transcriptomics and the electrophysiology and the morphology. And we're going to be covering this in more detail in a tutorial in February. So I'm not going to get into more detail on how this data was collected and how and why you can use it. So please come back in February for that. Another new project from the uh, cell types database is our synaptic physiology data. Um, that's also going to be featured in this tutorial in February. Um, and it shows not just how individual cells respond to these standard stimuli, but how they interact with each other. So again, that will be covered uh, coming up. So some sample, very basic experimental questions to get started on thinking about how do you use the cell types data, especially that single cell transcriptomics data. So how does the expression of a specific gene vary according to a cell type class? Um, say excitatory versus inhibitory, you can add additional genes um, either to this online viewer or go explore um, offline. You can look at what cell types are likely to be affected in the given disease that's linked to a specific gene. You can compare our cell types data to our atlases. The cell types data doesn't cover all of the brain regions like the atlases do, but you can still compare, say, a cell type marker gene to its expression pattern in the atlas. Um, or compare cell types to their long range projection patterns in the connectivity atlas that I'm about to cover. Spoilers. Uh, with our new patch seq data, you can make predictions between EFIS and morphology based on uh, gene expression. And um, you can also compare your data to our cell types classifications. So, again, we have those tutorials coming up in uh, February and March that are going to be covering the transcriptomics data in one of them and the patch seq and synaptic physiology data in the other. So, so we have some related data that is uh, to the cell types that is cell projections in our mouse brain connectivity atlas. This is enterograde projection tracing from over 300 source regions across the mouse brain. The cell types project was looking at cell morphology, but this is looking at sources and targets rather than cell shape. So it uses two related methods. We have injection tracing using uh, viral tracers to do an interrogate tracing from an injection site, which each of these dots on this plot is showing one injection site to identify a target based on fluorescence. And we also have some Cree lines in here that the fluorescence is generated by a Cree dependent viral injection. So it's injection tracing, but it only targets one cell type at a time. And in both cases, what we get is a fluorescent 3D image showing where that source or cell type from that source projects to through the rest of the brain. So again, each of these dots represents one injection site, one source that we're tracing where it projects to. You may need to click on these um, source structure filters or add it to the search box here in order for these dots to show up on the brain. Um, sometimes they don't show up, they don't automatically load. So if you want to go into any one experiment, clicking on its dot, you can also filter again up here. You can filter by mouse line and by tracer type to narrow down what you're searching for. Um, and then you're going to get this little preview of what that experiment was showing. Um, so uh, this is the preview of the projection density where the neurons on this source site project to. Um, you can take a look preview that data here. But to get more detail, click on that little eye icon, this little eye right here. And this is going to give you much more detail, including quantification um, across the hemispheres of, it gives you the uh, location of the injection site. Um, and in more detail, the, they've uh, quantified what brain regions that injection targeted. And you can see exactly what all brain regions that uh, target projected to. So you can go in and identify all of the known targets for a given source region or all of the known sources for a given target. And again, because we do have these, um, these injections that can that just trace all cells versus um, I happened to randomly choose one um, that was a Cree line that is only one cell type at a time. So you can compare 
what is the general projection pattern of this brain region versus what's the projection pattern of a specific cell type in this brain region. All right, so that's uh, the connectivity data and where to find more. I'm going to go back to the home page here to show you our last main data set that I'm going to cover, which is the Allen Brain Observatory. So this contains a couple of distinct data types tracking responses to visual stimuli in mice. We have two photon calcium imaging and electrophysiology data using neuropixels probes and behavioral responses. This is going to be the subject of a longer tutorial also in March at that Open for Neuroscience Symposium and tutorials which is gonna provide a significantly more detailed introduction to getting started analyzing this data, which can be challenging. Um, overall, this resource is interested in encoding of visual stimuli, which includes static and drifting readings, natural uh, photos, natural movies, and also noise. And you can get these stimuli and use them in your own experiments as well. And these recordings concentrate on visual areas, including six main subregions of the visual cortex. With the calcium two photon imaging, we get these cortical responses to the standard set of visual stimuli in real time, and it has behavioral measures for some runs as well. So we have these online viewers that will show you what is happening in this experiment view is the, the movie of what is happening in those the cortical responses. And then we've pre-calculated things like the orientation selectivity, um, the time to peak, the direction selectivity, and a bunch more information about these cells selective responses to visual stimuli. Um, but it's much, much more powerful to interact with this data via the SDK. These online viewers give great visualizations and help you explore and get oriented. But to do any kind of significant analysis, you will need to use our SDK. And that is going to be covered in detail in March. We also have electrophysiology data using mostly the same stimuli using neural pixels probes, which can record from almost 400 electrodes at a time. It's the same stimuli and protocols as this two photon imaging for some of the experimental runs, so you can directly compare this data. So note that the neuropixels, if you go back to the homepage here, is only accessible via this drop down menu at the top, and then you go down to visual coding neuropixels data. It's not in the icons on the main page. So what can you use this data for? You can look at how consistent a neuron's responses are to the same stimulus from session to session or between electrophysiology and two photon data. Um, in the neuropixels data, you can look at differences in spike patterns between the wild type versus the Cree line mice. And you can look at how do neurons with a different uh, particular tuning pattern respond to a different naturalistic stimuli. So if you want to learn more about what you can get from my lightning fast introduction here, or even what you can get from a longer tutorial that we'll have in March, we also have the summer workshop on the dynamic brain, which is a two week long intensive course on computational neuroscience, focusing on this data set. More information on that is going to be available in January. So that's what I'm mainly going to cover today as far as our data resources go. We also have some additional tools that we make available. We make all of our tools available to interact with and analyze data or for use in labs. So go up here to technical resources. Um, you can find our API and SDK. These facilitate access to our data sets and some basic computations that most users will need to do. There's instructions on both pages for how to uh, create an API query and also on, on the SDK, how to install it and how to use it. We also have a link here to our GitHub. All of our analysis code is available there and we welcome you to fork it and jump off to create your own analysis. Um, on that GitHub, we also have our modeling resources, the Brain Modeling Toolkit and Sonata Data Format. Those are going to be featured in our next tutorial in January 2021. So please come join us then to learn about how to expand on these modeling tools. Under Toolkit, we also have our biological products, like our transgenic mouse lines and our viral tools. So I mentioned these viral tracing uh, uh, tools that we have available. You can also acquire those if you want to use them in your own work. We also have schematics for our custom hardware available on this page. So all of the hardware that we build um, to collect this data, you can use our designs. Um, and another major tool that we have is the Common Coordinate Framework, which we uh, provides a coordinate system for standardized alignment of mouse brain data in space. And this is, again, going to be featured in an upcoming tutorial in March at that Open for Neuroscience Symposium. How do you access the CCF uh, files? How do you register your own data to that space? 
So we have a couple of additional data resources in collaboration with other uh, researchers that live on their own data sites. So the Microns Explorer gives access to our EM reconstruction of cortical tissue at microns-explorer.org. Um, this is one of our largest data sets. It does live on its own website. It doesn't live on brain-map.org. So head over to microns-explorer.org to access that data and come back in March for yet another tutorial to learn about how to access that data um, analysis tools and how you can use it for your work. And we also have BICCN.org, the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network. This also links to our cell types data, as well as additional data investigating cell types collected across species um, and across collaborative, the collaborative network. So this is related to our cell types data. So help. What do you do if you, if you have a question that I didn't answer today? Where do you go to get that answer? So the first place to look is on any of these resource pages any of these resource pages, you can click the documentation link and that is going to take you to a page that will have all of these white papers that describe how the data was collected, how, how the experiment was designed, the parameters that we use such that you would be able to uh, replicate this data yourself if you wanted to or to do your own version of the experiment. Say, if you wanted to be able to compare our mouse data to your rat brain data and you wanted to use the same methods we used. You can also click the help button here. Um, so documentation is gonna take you to detailed methodological details. Help is going to take you to um, information on search, information on metadata, um, and explaining uh, the website um, and some of the abbreviations that are used. Another great place to go with questions is our forum. You can get there by clicking updates and support in the header of the page here or by visiting community.brain-map.org directly. You can post questions, read past answers, and join our research community. You also can post about what you're working on with your research. Let us know what you're doing. So you can search here um, or you can search by category. Um, I search by category or tag to find information about specific projects. And coming up soon, we'll be at the SFN Global Connectome Conference, um, the virtual uh, meeting in January. So you can come ask more follow-up questions there. Um, and also again, get in touch with us at the forum. We also have cell biology resources at allencell.org. I'm not covering that today, but if those HIPSC lines with fluorescent tagging that can be differentiated into neurons or glia might be useful to you, please go check that out. So in conclusion, our open data resources are created to tackle big open questions in neuroscience and accelerate your research. We want you to use it. We release it, not just after we're done uh, analyzing it ourselves because we want you to get some use out of it as well. We also have these research resources such as mouse lines and analysis tools in addition to all of this open data. I've covered some examples. I wanna reiterate that these examples are just that. They are not meant to be comprehensive. There are so many other ways that you can use this data in your work. We're never gonna do every possible analysis on this. I could never possibly list every possible use of this data. Um, and that's even before you get into the possibilities that combine our data with your data. Um, and again, please get in touch via the community forum if you have questions or to let us know what you're working on. But first, some questions from you now. Thank you, Caitlin. I hope, well, thanks everyone for joining us. I hope you found that informational um, and helping to kind of get through all of our great resources. So Azim submitted one saying, they're working on neural circuits of anxiety using optogenetics, fiber photometry, photometry, excuse me, and behavioral analysis, as well as immunohistochemistry. They usually get lost on which ways to use the ATLAS data and how to extract data for immunohistochemistry as well as stereotaxic surgeries. So any yeah. help you can. That's a great question. So um, I'm guessing that you're using mice. So I'm gonna head over to the mouse brain atlas here. So if I'm understanding you correctly, so you're working neural circuits of anxiety, you use optogenetics. Um, as well as immunohistic chemistry. So you want to extract data uh, for your stereotactic surgeries. And I'm guessing you also want to try to be targeting brain regions that have specific genes of interest. So 
Um, the first thing I'm going to say is for targeting specific locations in the brain for surgeries, the CCF is uh, potentially going to be useful for you. I'm not going to cover that right now, uh, but the tutorial that's going to be coming up in March, I think is going to be a really useful tool for you because it provides this common, um, like a coordinate space, uh, as it says in the name, that will help you um, register your data. Um, so that, I think that's going to be something that's really useful for you. But as far as navigating um, the atlases in terms of space, so um, I'm just going to bring up a random gene here. Um, OK, so actually, I should demonstrate a little more slowly how I did that. So I'm going to search for a specific gene here in the search box and then click the experiment uh, button here. And this is bringing up uh, this, uh, this view of the slices that I showed earlier. So um, one thing that might help, whoops, that's not the button I wanted. One thing that might help is being able to see all of these um, slices at once. So each of these core, whoops, each of these corresponds to a slice in our reference atlas. Um, so you can see here, it says image one of 19. Um, and then it's going to give you all of these, uh, these regions um, that are visible on this view. But that is not what I was trying to get. Um, So you can um, also you can pull this up in 3D in our Brain Explorer. I should mention that uh, there is a way to pull up the there we go uh, the reference brain atlas. So that's going to be able to help you match our gene expression data to the reference atlas to get the brain regions labeled on here. Um, so I think that will help you get oriented to uh, the gene expression versus anatomy that I think will be useful in this application. And then as far as the coordinates, the CCF is going to be useful. I will also mention that a really common question that we get is about aligning our data to Bregma. So the CCF doesn't have uh, Bregma in it specifically because it's made of a combination of many mouse frames. Uh, but there's more information on the forum about how to uh, align our reference data to Bregma. Thanks. Uh, we have a couple from Gregory. Uh, yes. First being, can the Allen Institute differentiate specific iPSCs into neurons for them? So we can't differentiate them into the neurons for you. Um, but what we can do is if you go to allencell.org and then click on the cell catalog, you can get the, um, the iPSCs from the Allen Institute for Cell Science sent to your lab. And there's instructions on that page for how to go through the differentiation process. We have uh, instructions on how to do that. Uh, as well as many other procedures that you'll need to do in the lab with those HIPSCs uh, once you have them in your hands. They have a forum as well on cell science. Um, and I know that there are other labs who have differentiated those cells into neurons. So if you post there or take a look, I'm not sure if there's a post that already explains that, then you can get more information. Great, thanks. And then uh, another one from Gregory, do we collect EEG recordings? We do not collect EEG recordings. Uh, we don't have any uh, project going on right now that we work with living human volunteers to collect things like EEG or functional MRI. Right. And lastly, but we do have the anatomical MRI for all six of the humans who are uh, in the human brain atlas. Great. Right. Uh, and then the last one from Gregory um, was curious how to uh, access the EFIS data. I don't know if you ran through yeah. I think you are looking for the cell types electrophysiology data. So if you go back to the home page, click on the cell types database here. And then cell feature, whoops, cell feature search is where our electrophysiology data lives. Um, so for example, if you want to, I didn't go into how you can filter, but you can filter by species, say let's do human. You can also filter by what brain region. So let's, uh, let's actually not filter by that. Um, Caitlin, he's asking about an EFIS ABF file um, for downloading. Our uh, EFIS data is in the format of XML data. Um, so you can download it here as an XML. Um, 
and then just search online for how to convert for from an XML to ABF data. On any individual cells page, you can click this link to download that uh, cells data. Or back on the home page here, we have this download cell feature data link that will download all of the cells, electrophysiology and morphology data. Perfect. Awesome. He said that answered the question. And then last one we have from Hassan. Um, they're patching from LC interneurons into the brainstem, and uh, they are just read that the documentation for patch seek, which seems to be very complicated. Is there any courses for people getting hands-on experience for past patch seek procedures? That's a great question. So if you come to that tutorial in February, I believe it's February 24th, the information is in the chat. Uh, they're going to cover in more depth how they collected the data, how they developed that technique. Um, in uh, in the data that they collected. It's not going to be a hands-on demo. This is a virtual demonstration, uh, but hopefully that will clear up some of the questions that you have. They don't have any plans right now to do an in-person training. Obviously we can't do any in-person trainings right now. We want everyone to stay home and safe, uh, but they don't have any plans right now uh, for when it is possible to do things in person again, to hold an in-person training that I know of. But hopefully that virtual event will clear up a lot of your questions. Right. We don't have any more open questions, Caitlin, but I know that there's usually uh, some of our top three or four most asked questions that we see. So I'll pose them to the group. So what are the most used Allen Institute tools? Yeah. So our most used tools are definitely our atlases. That would be the mouse and the human brain adult atlas. Those are the most popular, uh, but the developmental atlases are also among the top five. Uh, and then lastly, this is one we see often is, uh, what is something about these resources that you wish more people knew? Ooh, um, I wish more people knew about our data analysis tools um, and our lab resources in addition to the data themselves. So we have all of these wonderful data resources, um, but we also have these technical resources. So um, on our GitHub, we have all of the code that we have used to analyze the data ourselves. So this is our GitHub profile. All of the data that we've used to analyze, uh, or all of the code that we've used to analyze the data lives here. Um, so uh, for example, um, they're, they're listed in order of when they were most recent, recently uh, updated. But scratch.highcat is um, a piece of R code that is what we use to create those classifications of gene categories, the, the gene, or not gene categories, cell type categories, based on their gene expression that I showed you in the cell types database. Um, so if you wanted to download this code and use it yourself, say if you have a large data set of single cell RNA sequencing and you wanted to sort those cells into types, you can check this out. All of our data analysis tools are in Python or R. Again, in the spirit of open science, we use open source languages. Um, so you should be able to get on to our website, download all of our data, um, and use all of our analysis tools online, or if you're going to download it and do any analysis on it, using free tools, free open source tools. Great. Thanks. We just had one more come in. Can you please show us an example of how to search for co-expression of other genes alongside a selected target gene? That comes from Teresa. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm going to show you how to do that using the mouse brain Alice. Um, so, uh, using the, actually, no, I'm going to show you how to do that using the brain atlas. So you go to the human brain atlas, you can choose any one gene. And then I'm going to select that gene here in the list. So, um, I went to the human brain atlas selected microarray, entered my gene in the list here, selected that gene by clicking on it to, to highlight that row. And then I'm gonna use this find correlates button upper in the upper right corner. This is another one of those overlooked features that I really love. This is another great example of that. So uh, DRD1, the top probes that are gonna come up are other DRD1 probes that target other parts of that gene. That's not a surprise. We do expect there to be a lot of agreement between the different probes for a same gene. And then the next gene in the list is 
cortostatin. I actually don't know what that gene does. And then GPR6, G protein coupled receptor 6. And you can see that the correlation in their gene expression patterns is, um, so DRD1 with itself is one, obviously. Um, between the other probes, the expression level is the highest. And then it's a 0.81 and then 0.80 correlation with the next genes that are not itself. Um, and you can see that they, the heat map, again, red is higher expression, blue is lower expression. Um, and this is showing you, you know, visually, you can see that these agree pretty well. Um, I'm also noticing that this heat map, it actually swapped the order of the, the rows here. So the top row um, is the, or the, it's listing them differently. The top row is the donor. The bottom row here is the structure. So it's showing all six donors of whatever structure it is together instead of separating it out donor by donor. So just know that you can adjust those heat map parameters as well. Great. It and would Caitlin, not be exactly the same for mouse, but uh, I think this would be a better question to answer on the forum where I can type out the answer a little, little more in detail. Great. So Teresa, check out the forum and you can pose that question and we'll get back to you. Uh, there are no more open questions. Um, we did have, there's also just one that we always hear for folks that are just getting started um, and they've not been using these tools before. What's the best way to get going? So searching and reading white papers, going to the forum and just kind of diving in. What are your recommendations for kind of just jumping in, Caitlin? Well, being here, I think, is a great way to get started. I've given you an overview that I hope will get you oriented to the whole breadth of what we have available. So then instead of having to go through and figure out which thing is going to be the best fit for you, hopefully by now you know what's going to be the best fit for you. So that's challenge number one, figuring out which of our many resources is what you need. Once you know what you need, um, the next things that I recommend to do are to go onto that page and check out the documentation and also the help. The help button, um, I think, is an overlooked resource to help figure out how to navigate the data on our website. Um, and then if you have specific questions um, that you can't find the answer to in one of those two places, um, a lot of the, the individual resources have metadata sprinkled throughout their page. That's another place to check out. And then the forum or some of our live events. So if you want to come here about how data is being used, that can also help orient you. So make sure that you are keeping an eye on live events that are coming up or virtual events that are coming up from us because um, many of those can be helpful if, uh, if not outright training in addition to uh, just being helping you learn about the applications. Great. Well, that's all we have for questions, Caitlin. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, we are going to post this on YouTube and also post the Q&A and um, answer the a couple of additional questions in the forum. Again, if you have any questions after today, please go to the forum, ask them there, and someone will get back to you with an answer. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us.